announcement I made yesterday, so I uh, returned your exams to you. Um, and there are a few things. One was the, uh, there should be a view that's your exam that has the comments. Are you able to see those in the uh, feedback, in a feedback folder in your, yeah? So that, and then I posted and then attached to that canvas announcement was my solution to the exam that you can read through and compare. Um, let me get back live here. So I was just, uh, I was, um, I was worried that when you when you guys talked to me the day that you turned in the exam that uh, you guys weren't going to know some dynamics, but I think you do. So, um, I, Chris. Sorry, I was just checking the under return homework. Yeah. The yeah. So there's a when you when you put the check mark beside it, there's um, a little button appears at the top. It says view. Instead of download, you know, where it, if you click view, it should display that as HTML. Yeah, it's a little little confusing, but uh, so I was going to show uh, this. So that was the uh, this is the distribution here, um, oh, a histogram. So we had a. Uh, a cluster here from uh, above 60, uh, 65 and the, and the highest 97, and then this cluster below 50. Um, if you got below 50, you're going to need to do some heavier work to catch up and, uh, and perform well in the final, for sure. Um, but don't, uh, don't rest on your laurels if you are in, in this group, too. Um, you know, um, nobody. Well, one person almost got everything right, which was uh, which was um, impressive. And uh, um, but most people, you know, missed something, um, one thing or another. And then a lot of people didn't answer a lot of things. So I, you know, you could have gotten some partial credit if you just at least tried to say something that you knew about that aspect. So don't don't leave things blank. If you know, say tell me something that you know. And I can potentially give you um, some points, right? So uh, there were uh, like the, the lower scores. Lots, lots of it was blank, in general. And uh, if if that weren't the case, I, I think that would have been shift, that would have been shifted more. But um, two things. One is uh, it, it was a little longer than I expected. But I also have learned from a number of you that you hadn't been doing the homework. So if you haven't been doing the homework. Um, then yes, it's going to take you 20 some hours or more uh, to to solve that. Um, if you were comfortable in the homework, I, I, don't, I don't. I think it would have been much, much, much less. And then secondly, I screwed up on one thing, and I don't know how many of you caught this, but uh, uh, David told me in office hours the other day, I uh, didn't look carefully at the homeworks. And in fact, problems at two, three, and four are all from chapter two. And all I told you was to do was chap was problem set two. How many people only did problem set two? That's, that's as far as you got. How many people did problems from three and four before the exam? Problem sets three and four. You did three. So no. How many people did didn't do any problem sets before the exam? You don't have to admit that. But uh, sounds like that's maybe what the case is. So maybe my mistake didn't matter because you may have not done the homework anyways. Um, anyways, uh, chap problem set, uh, I, I made the mistake thinking that they were aligned with the chapters. And in fact, they aren't. You know, it has problem set three sections 2.6 to 2.8 on it. And I goofed up on that. So I apologize for that. And I will take that into account when I, you know, f formalize the final grades in the class. But, um, we went over everything in class, and uh, and well, that's just that's the way it is. But um, right now, um, and I'll clarify this on Canvas uh, too under the assignments. You should be into the um, inertia 
And we're, this is the last day we'll spend on inertia, too, in fact. So you want to finish problem set five. I think that one's the one that's all, all respect to inertia. And then we'll move into forces, which will be the further problem set. So get up, get through. You know, if you haven't done the problem sets, do them. You're going to have to, right? All this stuff builds on each other. And if you want to get the F equals MA for a system, you got to get these kinematics correct, right? And it's going to take, um, uh, you know, you're going to have you're going to have to build that skill, and and you got you have to do a lot of systems. So. Um, I asked uh, in office hours to one person, was there anything that I can do to help incentivize you to do the homework? Um, I unfortunately do not have time to look at them or grade them, but if you want me to at least set a due date, I could or something, and make you turn them in. But uh, you're going to have to do these pro these problems if you want to to be able to get this stuff. So is there is there anything that that I could do at my end that would get you guys to do these homeworks? Any suggestions? Or what, what, uh, what's, what's, what's preventing you from doing the homeworks? Anything? Has everybody just lost in the class? Am I, uh, or what, what, what's the, give me some feedback here on what, uh, what do you all, how do you all feel after this, um, Thomas? Okay, we could do that. Um, so um, I'm happy to take suggestions of which ones you guys are struggling with um, and do those. Okay, so I'll, do, I'll happily do that, but I, I need you to give me a signal which, which one you would like to go over. Preferably um, at least one day in advance so that I can have time to, to look at it and think about it a little bit too. So how, how does that sound? One, one day in advance, just shoot me, uh, post on Piazza, uh, please go over this one in class, and I'll, and I'll do that. Does that seem, would that be helpful? That, Thomas, is that good, do you think? Yeah. All right. What else, Chris? Yes. Yes, I've, I've uh, gotten that request too to sort of increase um, uh, on increase the SimPy. So I will. Um, I'm going to try to do the. I'll try to do the, all the examples in SimPy um, that that you guys bring up. I. Um, it's a matter of my my time to some degree, and I. Uh, most of my examples are, are that I'm using in class are prepared on paper, and I've tried to do a few of them in SimPy. But I'll try to try my best to increase the SimPy side of things. And in fact, we're very close to getting. F, and once we have that, we can solve whole systems, and, and then we'll, we'll do some whole systems in class. So that, that'll be fun, I think. And um, uh, so yes, I'll, I'll, I'll increase that. The other thing is when I post this feedback thing during, mid, during the break, tell me something, right? If you don't tell me something, I can't, can't address that and try to go back, slow down, uh, go over something again. Um, do another example. So I, if you give me that feedback, you can put things that you would like me to do in the second half of the class, and I will try my best to adapt and, and change the plan a little so we can answer your questions and, and get, get, stay at the pace that you, want, that you guys need to be. And then also, uh, you can put in things there that you just want me to do in general, um, like the suggestion you just made, can, I, can, we have, uh, can we do a problem from the homework? Okay, so fill out that form. Um, if you guys are silent, I, I don't have a good idea of what you need. All right, so be proactive. I'm, I, I will do my best to accommodate and and um, and help you guys out. Right, you know the goal is for you all to um, come away with this this newfound skill to uh, model these complex systems, and uh, and I want to help you get there. So just tell me what you need. And um, any other things then? And what we could change uh, in the last five weeks to um, help you succeed. No? Okay. Well, th this is um, not too off, too far off what I was expecting, and um, the, it's the this stuff isn't simple. And um, you know, and I, I gave some 
questions there that certainly made you think. And so I'm glad that you've th you thought through them, and I think that you uh, have built up um, a lot better understanding of, of the kinematics aspect. Okay? So um, let's look then. <clears throat> Does anybody have specific questions about the exam? Problems. Have you had time to look over them? So this one was the first exam, I mean, it's first problem, and it had uh, this rod, this thing could rotate on the rod and slide on the rod. Some people miss that those both were there. Um, and then this pin joint here, too, this uh, can, can swing back and forth. And then this ring rotates in that joint, and then finally this moves. So how many, how many coordinates does it take to do those rotations? Five. There are five coordinates. And in this case, there are no motion constraints, so there was only, there's a m equals zero, five degrees of freedom. Okay, so you have to have, you got to have those five coordinates to um, specify what this thing looks like in any state in time. All right? Um, the, I think everybody, everybody did pretty fine, you know, pretty well on um, these first bits, just defining things. Um, some people, I, in my solution, I just picked the, the easy case. That always works, right? It's okay to pick that. But um, other people, too, tried to, uh, some people correctly chose a different set of uh, generalized speeds, and, and, that, and that's good, too, right? Because if you do, you can get your, uh, these equations that we see a little later don't get as nasty. Um, everybody pretty much got that. Uh, this one, everybody pretty much got, got this down to the velocity, but some people just forgot to calculate the partial velocities. And, uh, and, that, and once you get P4, and you can get there in different ways, like if you divide all the positions correctly, and then you do P4 um, dot dt, take the time derivative in, what, in the frame n, it, it would just spit out the, the velocity. And then all you have to do is take the partial, take that velocity right there, and in, and differentiate it with, the, with respect to the u's you chose. All right, so I, I did that, uh, but I, I did it in a few steps. I used the two-point theorem explicitly in these steps to sort of walk along um, each, rigid, each rigid body that had shared points in it. All right, so I started at O, so set the velocity to zero. P1 was moving... Um, along that uh, rod. And then after that, I said, well, P1 and P2 are both on rigid body R. So I get omega of R and N crossed with that position vector between P1 and P2, and then, and then walked through there and, and got those velocities. One thing I wanted to note, too, oh, in the definitions, and this, thing, this, is, um, this is the first time I've given an exam in Jupiter. I think it went pretty well in general, um, at least from what I could see. Uh, but notice how I, I included this extra picture in my solution where I drew all of my coordinate systems attached to each reference frame and labeled each Q. Um, <clears throat> you can describe that all in words without the picture. But uh, some of you said, I rotate around AX, but I have no idea what, what AX was because there was no, no picture. Uh, a couple, few people did include a picture that they, they sketched out. So you can include, include pictures in the Jupiter. There's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, but in Markdown, there's a little syntax. You upload the picture, and you, and you basically type the file name, and you can look that up. But, uh, or I can double-click on this to show you. So... I just uploaded that file, named it, named it this, and that's the markdown syntax right there to make the picture show up. So sketch, it, sketch out your free body diagrams in the future, put them out, post, post them in this notebook, okay? Um, and then you have something to reference to 
which helps a little bit on the text explanation. Some people uh, didn't have the picture, but successfully described the whole thing with just uh, the text properly. But you have to be very careful and precise, otherwise I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Um, that was the partial velocities. And then this was a doozy. Um, uh, but a lot of people got this successfully. Um, I asked you to explicitly do an eight-point, uh, one-point um, acceleration theory application here, and um, you could do it with respect to a number of points. Um, <clears throat> you could imagine p four moving in d, or p four moving in r. Um, I think are the, those are probably the only ones that people chose. Most people chose D, right? So you think about this moving in a path in D, which it's, it's a circular path. Um, but if you think about it moving uh, in R, it's moving on a sphere, right? It can, it can sort of have any, uh, not a sphere, a, a, to a toroid. Um, what would define that? And um, the key thing was, like if you have this ac acceleration of this point, um, how do you, this point P2 or P3 would work, in fact. How do I then apply the a point, a, uh, one point theorem, acceleration one point theorem to get this? And, uh, and, there was, and, and it's tricky. There's a lot of little details there to make sure this uh, is correct. But um, the, hey, where am I at? So, you remember you have to pick this point, and I call it P bar 4, that exists instantaneously at P4 at that time. And it has three subterms. First is P2, acceleration of P2, which I just called P2 ACCN. And then I use trig simp on each of the measure numbers to try to see if it would simplify some. But it's still sort of nasty. And then the second part of that is um, you're going to have a tangential and a um, centripetal term associated with, uh, sorry, equation's not there. So P4 bar has a centripetal term, right? And I chose D as my, and then a tangential term, uh, alpha D and N crossed with P4, or uh, P2 to P4. You get, even with simplification, you get a nas nasty here. I expressed them in uh, C there. And then lastly, you're going to have um, this acceleration in D of P4 that you have to add to it. And you could figure that out a couple ways. I, I wrote also it's centripetal, centripetal and, excel, and tangential acceleration. So that's what that looks like in D. So if you're sitting on the, on the ring, right, it has a velocity pointing, I'm sorry, an acceleration pointing um, uh, into the ring, which is the Y in my case, and, uh, and then also a tangential one that's um, uh, accelerating along, tangentially on the ring. Chris? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh. Well, um, I'd have to see that one. Yeah, if you could reproduce it, I, I can look at it. But uh, one thing about simplification, um, you probably found out that sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes just sits there and tries to work, but doesn't get anywhere, right? Um, simplification is not a simple thing to do in a computer algebra system. It's actually one of the harder algorithms to impl implement. And we have some. We actually have one of the best trigonometry, trigonometry ones imp in, implemented in SimPy. And it was written by an author um, with the last name Fu. It's called the Fu Method for Trig Simplification and does this pattern matching. And that's what Trig Simp will, will try to use. But it's not trivial always, especially when things get more complicated. And, uh, and it may be that um, 
I don't know in your case, we'd have to look at that specifically what happened. But in general, if you have an expression with a bunch of trigonometry terms in it, that will be able to do something. It, may, it could take an hour, though, if, uh, your, if your expression is way too long. But these, these only take um, a few seconds uh, for the, if you sort of set them up like I had here. Uh, but you could get caught uh, if you're not careful. All right, the last thing is there's a Coriolis term, right? And that's, and that's uh, associated with P4 moving in, in that D frame. And that's that two times angular velocity of D and N crossed with the velocity vector in D. Okay, so those were the terms, those, the five terms essentially. Um, and you could break them up maybe in slightly different ways, but essentially you got to, to apply that theory, you got to get a hold of those, those aspects. You add them all together, and I had a little check right here. So if I used the function A one point theory, and I just gave it those values, subtract those, express it in D, and simplify it, I got zero. Right? So that was my check to see if I got, got it right. And that's a good, good thing to do sometimes. Um, all right. So that was that. Um, pretty good on the on the true and false. I forget which ones were um, most confusing. There were a few that were associated with um, if you have a vector essentially perpendicular to another vector, would would dr terms drop out and and um, of of things? And would you would you get velocities equal to velocities if certain conditions? Some people miss, miss those um, different aspects, but got some right and got some, even though there were a few that had similar. Uh, any questions on the true and false ones? I, I forget which one. Um, I didn't write down exactly which ones were most, most missed, but uh, do you recall any that were especially confusing to you? No? Okay. <clears throat> and then problem three, um, here we have a, basically a di there was a disk that's rolling without slip on this plane, R. But R can slide around on H. And the key thing here is that the velocity of P in R has to be zero. Not P and H, okay, or P and anything else, but it, um, you had to remember that the, it's the uh, relative to velocity between the plate R and the, and the disc C. So not everybody wrote that clearly. Another way to think about it, though, is that I could find the velocity of the point at the contact point fixed in C and find an, a point that's fixed in R that's located at the same spot. And the velocity, if I subtract that velocity, one velocity from the other, that, that must also be zero. So there's, there's two ways you can sort of think of that. But if you wrote down this, um, that, that's all I was looking for there. And I got, I got a lot of comp, some complicated things in this one. Uh, but if you realized that that was the relationship and then a number of people chose the wrong, a lot of people chose the wrong number of degrees of uh, generalized coordinates here. S of t, I call it a spec specified in time. It's something that um, is not a generalized coordinate. All right. So I, my, my wording was, um, but c's motion along s is prescribed as a function of time. And it arises from external fluences, and it's not a result of the dynamical interactions. Okay, so it's basically like maybe s of t is a cosine omega t, and it just moves that um, disk back and forth along the rod, or maybe it's um, any any function you can imagine, whatever. But it's not uh, something that's going to change as a result of what's going on in the system. So a lot of people did choose that as a generalized coordinate, and it shouldn't be. 
So the only generalized coordinates are the ones that, the other ones that are listed here, um, phi, theta, and then you could locate um, R star maybe by X and Y. Four, four generalized coordinates to set the configuration of that. And then if I have velocity of P and R, uh, one way to do this is you could write out a two-point theorem for this. And one way to do it is if I say, uh, well, I, I, pro I could probably write out the expression for C star in R. And then I have to have then omega of C in R crossed with R from um, C, C star, I'm sorry, um, P to C star, where this is the contact point. <clears throat> so that's, that's one way to do this. Uh, and if you could write this out, which is not too hard, and this, then you could find velocity of P and R. Okay? So this, this is true, right, if I write out the, the two-point theorem for velocity. And uh, I can write this vector from C star to P. We could figure this out by omega of C and R uh, might equal omega of R and H plus omega of H and C. I, those are not, those are easy to write out. And then um, in this velocity, if you can write the position, a position vector to C star and take its time derivative in R, you could get a hold of that. So that's the uh, way I did it here. Um, so I created the reference frames, set those rotations, and then I located R, R star and C star. And then I located P, which is fixed in C. And set these angular velocities, set these um, time uh, linear velocities of those two. And then this method right here, I'll, I'll talk about that one in a second, but this method I said um, C star position from R star, time derivative in R. So that gave me this term. And here I just made sure to put in U's instead of X dot and Y dot. And then I add that cross product. which was omega of C and R crossed with P to C star. So that, that was that equation. And it, um, it gave me this velocity term. And actually, let's uh, look at that. Oops. Come on. There we go. Run this first cell. Go back to the bottom. All right, so then if I look at um, V, P, R, which is what we were after, that, that's it's expressed in S. And notice it's got um, U1, U2, U3, and U4 in it. All of the generalized speeds. It also has generalized coordinates, and it also has the, the derivative of S, which is specified. So that was the expression you had to get a hold of. Once you get a hold of that, you can set um, x and y are in, in the plane of R. So you could just take each one of these and set it to 0, each of the measure numbers, or express it in R and set those equal to 0. And you'll get these expressions, and you can solve for two dependent speeds. In my case, I 
solve for u1 and u2. Right, I dotted with rx, dotted with y, ry to get two scalar functions, solve for u1 and u2, and then these are two con motion constraint equations that hold. Um, I put another method up here to get to it. You could think about it this way too. I said, give me um, a point fixed in C at the contact point, right? And I used V2 point theory, um, knowing that P and C star are in the same disk. And then I said, well, velocity of P, but when P is fixed in R, so I use R to do the two point theory, I get these two velocity things that one is from O to P, but through R, and one is from O to P, but through C. And those are two different expressions for velocity with different variables in them. And then, but what I want to make sure is that the relative velocity of those two points, the one that's fixed in C and the one that's fixed in R, is zero. So if I subtract those two, I, I get V, P, and R again, and I see the same solution. So those are two ways to think about that, um, getting a hold of that constraint that you want. Questions there? I, I, ha I didn't have, um, yeah, anybody get that one fully correct? Um, I had people get these correct expressions, but they may have had the one extra generalized coordinate or speed or something, but it was, uh, so, so yes, a number of you realized um, just that it had to be between P and R, but there were other, just a couple other details, so that's any questions on that? So I think that that's a pretty good, you know, if you if you don't understand this one, go home and think and think about it, right? This is a good good thought experiment to wrap your head around this to to sort of get control over this non-holonomic motion constraint business, right? And then the last few bits there were, um, if you had those right constraint equations and you form, this was my script to like check all the partial uh, combinations of the partials to see if they commuted or not. And then it turns out that for each expression, the partial with respect to phi and y do not commute. And um, you can do this in a number of ways. I, uh, you didn't, you may or may not have used a for loop in Python, but I used a for loop to go through the different combinations of, of uh, generalized, um, or of uh, uh, U's there, Q, Q's, sorry, of generalized coordinates. Um, if you want to know exactly what's going on there, but um, we can talk about it. But basically, this is my first, you know, zero equals this expression, and that has to be the derivative of some function f1 with respect to time. And then you can, I use the diff function to pull off the coefficients. I said that if I just get the diff with respect to the different u value, that would pull off these coefficients that I, that equate to the partial of f1 with respect to that particular q. And then once I have that expression, then I can differentiate it with respect to the other q and compare it to um, the pairs, basically. There's a number of pairs there. Um, I probably shouldn't have done that with the for loop because it, it uh, maybe confuses it more than you need to. But um, for example, let's just feel like a, if I have the, the first one is u1 plus r u4 plus s u3 minus u3 y equals zero. So that's one scalar motion constraint. And that has to be equal to, we'll call, um, it's got to be equal to the time derivative of a um, configuration constraint, F1, right? 
Okay, so this, this involves um, u's, right? This derivatives of the speeds, essentially, and um, it has to be equivalent to this. So then you can write df1 dt equals um, the partial of f1 with respect to q1 uh, times u, uh, u1 plus the partial of f2. Um, and actually, I'm using, let me use the correct variables here. x was my u1. y was my u2. Um, theta was my u3. And phi was my u4. And then we don't, we don't have a term that's just a derivative in time because there's no explicit thing in time here. All right, so then this is that, right? So one there. U4 is this term. Oops. And then U3 is uh, S minus Y. So U makes a lot of sense, right? Oops. That one. So the coefficients equate to this, and then you've got to check, does the partial of F1 with respect to, um, the one that I said didn't match was, uh, yeah, the phi and the y, so we'll just say phi and y equals the partial of F1 with respect to the partial of y and the partial of phi. So that's, that's what I'm checking there. So you've got to pull off those coefficients. You could just inspect it and write them down. I use the diff function to say, give me the derivative with respect to u1 of this expression, and it will give me 1, da, da, da. And then I checked all the pairs. All right? And the last thing is it has four generalized coordinates, and these do not, are not integrable. So, so that's two motion constraints. You get two degrees of freedom at that point. All right? So that's, that's the deal there. Um, yeah, spend some time with this. I know you already have spent a lot of time with it, but um, um, go over that and uh, think about the, these different details and aspects and what you, what you missed. Okay? Uh, other questions on the exam? Josh? Yeah. Yes. So, in the case, if for whatever reason you wanted to describe the system in a different reference frame, say a reference frame R, um, still want to describe the vector, the position of C relative to O, in vector frame R, or in reference frame R, what was throwing me off was that whenever I tried to do that, I, I didn't need uh, Q2 to describe it. As in Q2 was what your what? My Q2? Q2? Rotation of a. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was struggling to wrap my head around what this implies because if you wanted, it was telling me that if you wanted to describe it in one reference frame, you needed five generalized coordinates. But if you wanted to describe the exact same system in a different reference frame, you'll need four generalized coordinates because the, you know, the, the point O doesn't have a rotation around A. It's only a, a distance. I don't know if I was just not understanding. Yeah. Um, let me check one thing here. So, if I get down to my calculating my velocity there, if I say p four dot um, velocity in n dot expressed in r, is that? Yeah. And then and then you're saying that one of the generalized coordinates may not be in there. Right. Well, not, not even generalized coordinates. Oh, well, yeah, I guess generalized coordinates. Sorry. 
Um, I'm going to use a little convenience function here. Um, actually, I've got to do this. That's not iterable. Express in R. Oh, no. That's not what I meant. Find dynamic symbols. This is a little function. I don't know if I've shown you yet, but it'll just see what's in there. And it has uh, Q3, Q4, and Q5. Three, three of the five. So <clears throat> if I'm in R, yeah, let's try to think about that. So we're taking, talking about the velocity of uh, P4 in, the re with, in reference frame n, with respect to the reference frame n, expressed in the R frame. So the expressed in the R frame, and it's only got Q4, Q5, and Q3, right? No, the, um, the, the number of degrees of freedom never change um, in in. Okay? So if we're, if we're asking about how many degrees of freedom does this system have in the reference frame in, which in this case is the inertial reference frame, um, it will always have the same number. Now, if you look at particular, particular vectors, um, they may or may not be functions of all the generalized coordinates. All right, and so the one you're asking, let's just let me just clarify again. You're asking for the um, what vector are you interested in? And uh, it would actually be any vector as long as it's expressed in R. Because what I'm, what I'm getting at is that any vector expressed in R. Yeah. So if I'm um, in R looking at this vector, and it, and it may be moving in R, um, I'm moving with um, the, my my motion is 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 essentially controlled by Q1 and Q2. Right. So I'm uh, I don't really notice if I'm just viewing R, like say I'm in a black box in R. Um, Watching some vector, it's it's irrelevant what Q2 and Q Q1 and Q2 are to me. How that arbitrary vector is looking relative to me in R in R, and uh, I think that's the is that. Is that and if I'm standing in D, then Q1 Q2. Q3 and Q4 also are going to matter. I can, uh, it's sort of about like, I can be on a train that's moving and, and there's some coordinate that might be telling me the, that, telling, the, telling me the position and velocity of the train and I can, I can play baseball on the train, throw a baseball, but it's irrelevant what 
the distance the train traveled from um, the train station to where we happen to be at that time about how baseball is going on in, the, in, the, in that vector that I'm looking at in the train. It's, it's, it's a, yes. Uh, it's possible, I guess, is what it said. I wasn't, I don't know. No, no, it's a good question. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's not that clear. It's, it's, it, goes, it goes back to, um, uh, yeah, so what, what a reference frame is. And I'm trying to think of a better way to explicitly. Has anybody else got a better way to say that? Um, if you're standing in N, then your orientation R matters. If you want to go in But if you're standing in R, then the orientation of N doesn't matter because O is, o is on that axis of rotation, so it's not going to, the rotation of that axis is not going to affect its position. So uh, if we um, uh, it's kind of a fuzzy question. Say I had a vector that <clears throat> um, tracked a particle that sort of um, moved with respect to R, it, like jumps from this part of R to this part of R. And, that, and then a vector would locate that position of that thing. If I'm standing in R, um, I'm going to see that that vector is going to change, right? So maybe the vector is from where I'm standing uh, to this thing, and I and I just watch it go across. Um, that vector is going to look the same no matter what Q2 is to me. Right, so it's irrelevant what angle Q2 is. Where I'm, you know, if I'm flipped up here, flipped down there. If this thing, ha if this vector, the vector is always going to pass in the same, you know, in the same way in front of me. If if this particle has sort of a fixed motion relative to R, does that yeah. help it, a little? At the end of the day, it doesn't change how the degrees of freedom. Made that clear. It does not. Yeah, in in. Yeah. It's, about yeah. So if I want to say, if I, if, and I may, a good question if I ask you, how my degrees of free question, degrees of freedom question, whether I specified the frame or not, but uh, um, you, ha you do need to be, if I say, how many, how many degrees of freedom um, does D have in R? It's only one, right? But if I say, how many degrees of freedom does D have in N? It's four. So yeah, you got to say that frame. Okay. Other questions? You hate dynamics or you like dynamics? Not the right question to ask. So, um, but but I I. Uh, I think you guys did good, and I um, we, we got some learning going on here. So that's the that's the uh, good outcome of this. So on that point, sorry, real quick question. You just said, you know, how many degrees of freedom does X have in Y? How many degrees of freedom does O have in R? Is it two or is it three? It be, does it takes two coordinates to describe it because the rotation doesn't matter? Yeah. So if I'm standing in R and I ha and I like have a vector from me to O. Um, That that point O is uh, going to need three, right? We're in three D space, so I'll need to know. Um, I don't. I mean, I catch myself here. <laughs> uh, if I'm say I draw, say I stand on R, and uh, and I draw a vector from me to O. And you want to describe it. In yeah. So the the three coordinates. Could be Q1, Q2, and Q3, right? To to get the exact location of O from a given point on R, from the viewpoint of R. All right. So. Uh, oh. 
Yes, oh, you're right. Um, I think I'm saying that wrong. Uh, yeah, Q2 doesn't matter. It's only 2 because we're in the... Um, O is always in the plane of um, the rod L, that's made up by the rod L and the rod R. So yeah, there's only two. And so there's a, a constraint there that ensures that O is always in that um, common plane, uh, essentially. Okay. Well, you could, I guess you know, one way to like formally think about it is like, if I'm at one point and I want to locate another, another, okay, another point in space, right? I have to have three coordinates to get me there. X, Y, and Z, and I'll get to that point. And so O and R, and some point on R, maybe the center mass of R, they are, they have that three-dimensional relationship in space. But you could, we could say that, um, um, you could state it formally as a, uh, there, there is a configuration constraint that ensures that O and the center mass of R are always in the same plane. Right? And that would subtract, um, so big M is the number of generalized coordinates that you might spe specify, minus the configuration constraints would get you little n, the minimal set of configuration, uh, minimal set of generalized coordinates. So in that case, uh, yeah, O and R star maybe are, are always in a plane and it only takes two coordinates then to locate O from R star. Yeah. All right. Good. Make me think too. All right, folks. Okay. Uh, let's let's just take a five minute break, and then we'll talk a little bit more about inertia. You know, I, I will. Cur I'm going to curve. Does it, in the class, so there, there also your grade that you got on there will um, is only going to be sort of it's only reflective of your uh, comparative score with the rest of the class, and um, there will be some some curve or whatever at the end. If you're worried about that, Chris. Yeah, that's because. Uh, I've forgotten or I hadn't had time. Is that, is that, that was, uh, yeah. We haven't got there yet, but it was inertia. Yeah. I will post those. I'm, uh, yeah, it's hard, I uh, miss keeping up with them. Um, uh, so I'm behind. Yeah, I was, I spent, um, I got two, two exams to make and grade for two classes right now, and they eat up eat up a lot of time. So I'll get those up. All right, let's talk a little more about inertia. Um, so I'm going to sh say a few things and then um, show some stuff in SimPy and another uh, little app that will help, uh, help us think about this, this a bit. A um, couple of notes. This is just sort of something I didn't say last week. Um, for a general dyadic, pre and post multiplication, by an arbitrary ve vector, give different results. But an inertia vector, I'm sorry, inertia dyadic, if I can spell it, is symmetric.
Okay, so m multiplication is not commutative with respect to dyadics, except if the dyadic is symmetric, and, and, and we have that case. We're going to really only use dyadics um, in this class for, for expressing inertia. Okay, so that's just one, one thing to keep in mind. Um, another thing is that uh, there is only one inertia dyadic. Even though there are an infinite number of inertia matrices. Right? The inertia matrix depends on the reference frame. And we showed how um, to express a inertia dyadic um, in SymPy as a matrix. And if you recall, you have to give it a reference frame to do so. So those are a couple of uh, useful tidbits here. Uh, next. Um, Here's a useful concept, too. Um, when O is the center of mass, of some collection of particles or a rigid body S, Then we're going to call the um, central inertia dyadic we're going to call it the central inertia dyadic. When O is the center of mass of S, then call um, the central inertia dyadic I of um, S with respect to O um, is the central inertia dyadic. That's what I want to say. And there's a relationship between dyadics for different um, points For example, if uh, you have a point Q, which is an arbitrary point, then we can write the inertia dyadic of part collection of particles S with respect to Q. You can write that as the inertia dyadic of collection of particles with respect to, I'll call it SO, and that's going to be the mass center of S, plus an inertia dyadic of SO with respect to Q. All right, so Q is an arbitrary point. Okay. So this is this is a nice uh, thing. If I have the mass center of S, and then I can figure out this dyadic, 
um, or the, iner the central inertia, and then I can figure out the inertia of the, with respect to Q um, of uh, just SO, right? This, this is a collection, or, or a rigid body. This is a single point, single particle, the, ma you know, the mass at the mass center. Uh, I just add that, and I can get the inertia of S with respect to that arbitrary point I'm interested in. And this is a um, general form of the parallel axis theorem. And I'd spell parallel. And, and this often isn't, isn't that complicated to calculate because it's, um, you only have to consider the mass center as a particle there. So that's useful. I think my page size is goofy. Okay, and then the last little thing I want to talk about before we jump over to SymPy is uh, something called principal axes. Do anybody does anybody know what that <coughs> that is with respect to? Inertia. Recall that from Dynamics 101. Products of inertia are zero. So we can um, um, express the inertia dyadic with respect to any coordinate frame. And in general, we're going to have moments of inertia and products of inertia. There will be all um, nine values in that dyadic, uh, right? The measure numbers of the, di the dyadic, um, the unit um, dyadic components are going to be these not or nine values in a dyadic, and the vector is three, right? So those in general all are all some value. Uh, but <clears throat> it turns out that if you pick the right coordinate system, oriented in the right direction, that you can make the products be zero if you express it in that frame, and you only get moments of inertia. So you're going to express it any inertia with three values and uh, the directions of that particular reference frame. And the directions of the particular reference frame are called the, um, the principal axes. Um, <clears throat> this... Uh, this book here is essentially symmetric, and when you have a, a symmetrical geometric object, the principal axes align with the um, axes of symmetry on the geometric object too. Okay, so um, this book has a geometric axis, this, this, and this, right, that are associated with that geometry. And if we assume that this was uniform thick and you know a perfect uh, cuboid shape then um, it would not have any products of inertia we'd only have to have three inertia values that tell us the mass distribution about each of those principal axes right and those values are always going to be sometimes they, uh, they they could all be the same if I had a sphere right the principal axes are any axes and and the values of inertia about those axes are all equal to each other, right? But if I um, start to get um, symmetry only about particular planes, as this one does, 
then I'll have different values of those three inertia, moments of inertia, relative to those axes. So for this book, um, the mass distributed about this axis is greater than the mass distributed about this axis, this axis, right? Um, I have more mass that's further away from the axis than this one. And in fact, this one is the, uh, has the maximum value. This one has the minimum value. And then this one has a value that's in between the two. Okay? Um, if I spin this book, I'm going to mess up my Thomas Kane book. If I spin the book like this, right, I, I can spin it about the axis, that inertia. And it, and it actually just sort of spins about it. And uh, if I spin, and that's the maximum value. If I spin it about the minimum, let me do it better. Right? I can, um, I can essentially spin it right about that axis. If I spin it about the middle one, though, notice it does a flip. It doesn't always. Uh, <clears throat> it won't spin about that axis. In fact, even if I were perfect at what I'm doing, and this was a perfect, uniformly dense cuboid. Um, if I spin this thing, it's always going to do this funky flip. It's not going to spin like this about its middle principal axis. Um, so that's, that's an interesting, interesting thing. Um, in the moments of inertia, you know, they have, actually that reminds me of a video I have that's relevant too. Let me show that. Uh, the moments of inertia... cause funny things to happen. And uh, you may have seen this video before, but uh, where are my videos? Um, I think it's this. So this is on the space station, and that's a funky little object. It has some symmetry to it, and uh, and you spin it, but then it has this reversal, right? Which is uh, not intuitive. I mean, why would you think it would do that? Um, it has to do with uh, a similar concept that this thing won't spin about its axis too, right? So that. <clears throat> the inertia of that object governs this reversal. And this is something that um, even if the, if the object was perfectly uniform in density and perfect in geometry, uh, you could still get this um, effect. All right? So inertia is a funny thing. Uh, this is called the Zan Zanibikov. I guess you can read it there. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. A, German, uh, a Russian name, it sounds like. Um, talked about that. I don't know, do I have any other uh, fun inertia things? I forget. I wish I had, I've got another fun toy that maybe I can bring in next time. Yeah, I think that's um, all there for now. But, so... That gives you a little idea of what the uh, principal um, axes of inertia are. Now, for an arbitrary body that doesn't have geometric symmetry, um, those axes still exist, but they're going to be um, a function of the mass distribution in the object. And you can find those axes. Um, it turns out that uh, finding those axes is an eigenvalue problem. So let's write a few few more things here, and then I'll show you how this works in practice. Um, in general, the inertia vector, which is the first thing that we talked about, is not parallel. Let me just write that to that vector in hat, in a hat. Um, but um, sometimes it is. 
And when it is, uh, then in a hat and its line that it lies along, L, are called a principal axis of the collection of particles, rigid bodies, for point O. And then there's a, um, a plane that is normal to NA and um, it's called the principal plane. The moment of inertia is a principal moment of inertia about this axis. And then if um, a unit vector SI hat um, constitute um, principal directions, um, if aligned within A. And then you can write in a dyadic like this, the principal dyadic. So I, as with respect to O, um, if you have a principal dyadic, you're only going to have Okay, so if I have these, if I, if I discover these three principal directions, S1, S2, and S3, then there's a scalar, I1, I2, and I2, I1, I2, and I3, only three of them that are principal moments of inertia, and, the, and that, um, that dyadic has no components that are associated with products of inertia. Okay? So you can write any inertia dyadic in terms of three values instead of um, six, right, where three of them uh, are, are repeated that make a total of nine, if you know these axes, okay? So, um, any questions on that? Let's show a few more things, if not in SimPy. Where are we at in time? Yeah. Questions on the principal axes there? So there are some axes that um, you, you can find them. If you can find them, uh, you can describe the inertia with only three values instead of the full inertia matrix, essentially. Anybody know how to find those? No guesses? Been too long? Anybody, anybody else? <clears throat> so it turns out that um, to, to find those, you, have, you can solve an eigenvalue, an eigenvector problem. All right, so we have a 3 by 3. We can express um, an inertia dyadic in a given frame, and we, can get, we get a 3 by 3 inertia, inertia matrix. Right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and do our standard import here. Usually it 
think he was driven pretty. And um, <clears throat> we're going to need a reference frame, so I'm just going to go ahead and create a reference frame. And then uh, we can create an arbitrary inertia dyadic. I showed you this uh, convenience function. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say IC is going to be the inertia dyadic with respect to the centroid of some collection of particles. And uh, if you recall, there's this inertia function. And I can provide it the unique six values and a reference frame. And this sort of gives the simplest definition of, a, of an inertia dyadic for us. And optionally, I can give the products of inertia. But I have to give it the moments of inertia. So let's start off by giving it um, all six of those unique values. So I'm going to say in reference frame, frame A. And then I had some values here. Let me remind myself what I want. Uh, two, three, nine, zero, four, zero. Two, three, nine, zero, four, zero. So I, I get a uh, inertia dyadic here now. And Oh, yeah. Some of them are zero. I was like, why aren't there nine here? It's because I made some zero. Um, we get our inertia dyadic, and this is sort of a, an arbitrary inertia of some object. I can express that as a matrix, and, and that's what it looks like. So it has moments of inertia with respect to the A frame, two, three, and nine, and then I have two products of inertia here and then zeros for the other two. So some, iner some inertia. Um, anytime you see zeros in a in an inertia matrix, that means that that object has some symmetry. That's another thing to re remember. Okay? If it doesn't have products inertia, um, it can have uh, you know, just two products of inertia, um, two pairs, um, or three pairs. And those missing products of inertia um, are associated with symmetry about uh, the associated plane. So right here we have some object, it has some symmetry, but it uh, has some uh, non-symmetry about one plane. And the, uh, this, is, this is a matrix in SymPy. And I just have numbers in here for now. <clears throat> so um, if I want to figure out the principal moments of inertia, I can actually call, uh, I'm sorry, I want to um, name this IC matrix now instead of di dyadic. And then if I look at IC mat dot tab and E, it's got um, some functions associated. There's lots of stuff that you can do with the matrices, but two of them are eigenvalues and, and eigenvectors. So if I look at eigenvalues, um, I don't have to give it any arguments. It just has a couple of optional arguments. So basically, if I, if I call this, I get um, some values. And it return, it's a little confusing what it returns. But um, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, is the eigenvalue of each. This is a dictionary that has three entries in it. This is the eigenvalue, which are the keys of the dictionary. And then the value of the, each of the things tells you um, how many of that eigenvalue there are. So it's possible to have repeated eigenvalues. So if I just had, if it only had these two, this might say two, two. So there's two eigenvalues with value two, one eigenvalue of, of value 11. Right. So those 
1, 2, and 11, um, we can access those by, uh, if I do the list of icmat.keys, since it's a dictionary, I get the keys of the dictionary. Um, sorry, I forgot eigenvalues. Eigenvals.keys. That gives me that the, 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 the eigenvalues, right? So I have a maximum eigenvalue. Um, a uh, minimum and then one in between for this particular thing. Now, <clears throat> that means that I can express this um, inertia with only these three values if I want, but I also need the directions, right, of these principal axes. So the to get the directions, that are the, uh, comes from the corresponding eigenvectors. So if I call eigvex, I get this output, all right? And it's a list of some tuples that contain three things each. And I got three tuples. So what I get here is, <clears throat> notice that the first value, 1, 2, and 11, those are my eigenvalues that I saw above. The second value, once again, is the count, how many, if I have repeated ones. And then the third is um, a, lit, a, uh, a matrix of, a column matrix of the eig that particular eigenvector. All right, so the maximum principal axes is oriented along this vector in the A-frame. Okay, so if I, and these are um, already, um, I think, are they normalized? One, uh, one squared, two squared, square root of, they're not, they're not normalized, I guess. Let's, uh, let's call this evix. And then I'm going to, let's try to grab out the first one. And if I want the eigenvalue, so we'll say eval1 equals the first thing of that, eval1. And then evec, the associated evec with that eigenvalue is then going to be the, uh, the last thing. So that's going to be 2. And let's just evec 1. Okay? So I've got the first eigenvalue and its associated eigenvector. And um, for some reason, I think it's a little, I don't really like the output of this, but it's just what SymPy does. It actually gives you a list. So really what we want is one more indice there. And I think then that gives us a matrix. Yeah. All right. So unfortunately, you got to do a little, too much indexing to get a hold of what you want, right? The eigenvalue and the associated eigenvector. And these are, um, these would be measure numbers in the A-frame, okay? So we, we've already, you know, we got out of dyadic world and we're in just matrix, so we're only thinking about in the A-frame here because that's what we've expressed it in. Uh, and you can do that for, for each one. So we'd have eval2 equals evex, um, the second one, and the first value out of that, and evex2 equals evex... Um, 1, 2, and 0, and eval 3 equals evex, sorry, e, yeah, evex 2, and evex 3 equals evex uh, 2, 2, 0. All right, so 
eval 1, eval 2, eval 3, or like that, and then evec 1, evec 2, evec 3. All right, so that, that's a little right, associated with eigenvalue with eigen, eigenvector there. Oh, and I wanted to check whether um, um, evec1, for example, I think the uh, norm, normalized, yes, yeah, so it, it, it doesn't um, give you unit vectors either. So we might want to, you can use, if you have a matrix, there's a normalized command that would actually turn it into a unit vector, too. So we could say evec1, evec2, and evec3. So now, now those are <clears throat> unit vectors of length 1 in A that correspond to the principal axes for those values of inertia. And then, so that, that, that's the basic process of getting what the principal moments of inertia are in the axes. And I only did it with numbers here for, for a reason. Um, you may recall from linear algebra that computing eigenvalues for larger than 2 by 2 matrices gets a little nasty. And uh, typically, you only you do it numerically. Okay? And, and this, is, this is one place where SymPy is not um, that fabulous of a you know, it doesn't offer a fabulous solution. So let's just, let's just see what I mean. If I say um, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, right, six, no, F, six values, if I create those symbols, A, B, C, D, E, F, and I'm going to specifically also tell SymPy that these are real. So, we're, um, so inert, uh, and these are going to represent the inertia scalars. Um, in the A-frame of this, of this collection of particles. And they're all going to be real, not complex values. Senpai assumes everything's complex otherwise. And then I'll say, once again, I C mat equals um, ME inertia A, B, C, D, E, F, all in the uh, A-frame at the beginning. And then two matrix A. I C mat. So now I have a, a, just an arbitrary symbolic matrix here, and we can we can take the eigenvalues of that. Um, so if you recall, take, taking the eigenvalues, you have to solve a polynomial, um, and the order of that polynomial that is corresponds to the uh, dimensions of this system. So for a 2-by-2, um, two two, you just have to solve a quartic. For a 3-by-3, three three, a cubic. 4-by-4, four four, a, um, uh, a... I'm sorry, quadratic was the 2-by-2, two two, cubic was the 3-by-3, the 4-by-4 three three, four four is the quartic, and then 5-by-5 um, five five quintic, and so on. So on. Um, does anybody, what's, uh, can you uh, create an analytic solution, symbolic solution for a uh, quadratic polynomial? The quadratic equation, if you recall, right? That you form a, form a quadratic equation. What about for a cubic, order three? Have you ever done that? So it turns out you can, just like there's a quadratic equation, there's cubic equations, and there are three roots to that. And there's a quartic one, too. And you can, so you can find the four roots to a fourth-order polynomial. But it turns out that for a fifth-order fifth polynomial, quintic, um, it has been proven mathematically that there is no analytic solution. So beyond 
a fifth order, you can't even solve it symbolically. Right? But, but this one, you can. And maybe you've already typed it, but if I type eigenvalues, that's the symbolic solution, right? So, th so this is sort of why this is why you d do this numerically. Um, not every symbolics are very nice in, uh, for a lot of things, uh, but. Uh, and, you, and we can do the third order, poly, you know, the third uh, three by three. It'll even solve the four by four, but it can't even solve anything beyond that. So we can use SymPy to do these um, symbolically if you like. And uh, if this thing is not arbitrarily complex, then you'll, you'll get simpler answers and things. But um, another thing is like to look, look down in here. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to find this too, right? Complex values. So if you recall, um, you can get complex values um, for an arbitrary matrix. Inertia matrices are always symmetric, though, and, um, and are always in finding the eigenvalues of, of a um, symmetric matrix with real values is always going to give you um, real values back. So we're not going to get any complex inertias in that case. Um, so I think this is, uh, we said that the entries were real. I think we, if we made it symmetric, we wouldn't see any eyes in there, right? And, uh, well, actually, we, we shouldn't see any eyes in there. I think that it's missing one more assumption that probably would make that a little simpler, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. Okay. Um, and we could create a new, we could create a new reference frame using those coordinate that we just found and pick those eigenvectors as the axes and express the inertia in terms of uh, these principal uh, moments of inertia and the principal axes instead. And that becomes, it, it, it often is useful because it's simpler to express the inertia. Uh, one, one more thing, I'll just show you one uh, useful thing. So we're going to eventually you're going to have to transition to numerically evaluating things. And we're, we've been doing everything symbolically so far. And you can plug in numbers in SymPy, and it will um, calculate, you know, um, multiply two no numerical values to arbitrary precision. Uh, but in reality, a computer on a computer, you um, have floating point uh, numbers that you have to deal with. And uh, there's round-off error, and there's different things. But um, there's a very useful function in SymPy to go from um, a symbolic equation to a something that you can evaluate with with uh, floating point numbers, and we're going to use that um, this concept when we move to uh, numerically integrating the equations of motion. So this this function lambda phi has a funny name. Um, <coughs> doesn't you wouldn't know really what it is, but there's a concept of lambda functions in Python. So this creates a function out of a symbolic statement. So what I'm going to do is, I forget the order of everything always, but it takes the arguments of the function and, ex and an expression. In our case, I want to get these symbolic expressions of these three eigenvalues here. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to get the keys, right? Remember, those are the actual expressions. And I'm going to write this little, a little list comprehension um, that says, no, actually, I'm just going to wrap it in list, and it'll give me a list of those symbolic keys. So, um, i just call it, I'll shorten that. There's, there, there are the expressions symbolically for those. So I'll just store it in there. And then we know that the only values in there are A, B, C, D, E, F. So those are the arguments of the function. And then I give it the uh, list of expressions. And, and I'm going to call this F. What it does, let me just make it more explicit, it returns a function that you can now use to numerically evaluate things with floating point. So if I call that, <coughs> takes the symbolic expressions 
and it creates a Python function that I can now use. And like if I look at the type of it, it's a function. So if I pass in some numbers, uh, actually, what were our ones above? Uh, 23904, 23904. It gave me nan. Da da da. <clears throat> Has a problem with the square root. We had i's in there. This um, doesn't work as nicely as I want, but right here, these are real values. You can fix this, at least for this case, and you don't always have to do this. If I just add a um, complex component to each of these numbers, because we have this, All right? So I just add a zero complex component, and that that, that'll, that makes them each a complex number. And to and to convince you that, I can say type of one point oh is a floating point, and then type of 1.0 plus 0.0j is complex. So then if I call that, I get, I get these numbers back. 1, 11, and 2, which are eigenvalues. But they're evaluated now at, to whatever floating point precision of the computer has. And then it has this, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, it has this, um, complex component here that's basically zero out to the machine precision of the computer. So this, um, what we did is we took those symbolic expressions for computing. That was like the general form of the eigenvalues, uh, calculating the eigenvalues for a three by three. And now I have a function that just spits those out numerically for any arbitrary. So this lambda phi function is, is quite useful um, when you want to go from uh, Symbolics to numerics, and it also, it's pretty nice. I can do something like this to, um, let me just make a simple expression, um, uh, a squared plus b squared, or maybe uh, we'll do np square root, sorry, sm, so a symbolic expression. And then I'm going to do uh, f equals sm dot lambda phi. A and b is the arguments. And then that expression. And now I can call um, 1.0, 2.0. Right, it'll calculate that. <clears throat> we, there's another pack. So in, in Python, you don't have uh, arrays by default. But there's a really nice package called NumPy that allows you to work with arrays. So then I can do something like um, a, uh, not a, let's use uh, uh, value 1 equals np.array. And I'm just going to make it a 1D array. Right, so this has three values in it. And then v2 equals np array. 2, 6, and 8. So I make them both the same length. And then I can use f on those two arrays, v1, v2. And it'll compute that sum of the square root of sum of the squares for each array value, just like you're probably familiar with MATLAB or, 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 or such. So this does a, now does a vectorize. These are, turn into vectorized functions, so they're capable of operating on arrays of numbers in the same way they are a single number. Okay, so that's, that's how you can sort of, if you need to go and start evaluating things floating point and with arrays, you can go, um, you can use this function, lambda phi. All right, where are we at? Um, we got five minutes. Let me show you one more thing. Um, I'll post that notebook. But this here is a um, application that, can I squish it? I don't think I squish it and do this. Uh, that I uh, wrote because I needed to know the moments of inertia of a human. And it's based on a guy, it's called Yeadon, a guy, um, there's a professor at 
uh, Lowborough University in England named Fred Yeadon, who uh, made a quite nice um, inertia estimation mathematical model of a human. And it's a function of the joint angles of the human, right, and um, a bunch of parameters, a bunch of measurements about, like, how fat your arm is, uh, what your weight is, et cetera. And you can control the joint angles with these little tabs. And um, here, it, it outputs the mass center in the inertial reference frame that's attached to the center of the hip, essentially. And then it also gives you the inertia of the human with respect to its center of mass um, with respect to that particular reference frame, right? So, you know, I got this sort of 3D human here, and there's the reference frames. And if I um, somersault is just doing like what you do if you do a flip, right? So I can see... Um, that the inertia values and the center of mass change because they're only they're outputting with respect to this inertial frame uh, down there. Um, but I can also do things like uh, uh, make the, you know, I can put the body into different configurations. So maybe I, I bend forward. Um, raise the arms up. And while I do this, I'm going to click this little tab, in, and it's going to show the center of mass. Right? That blue dot is now the center of mass of a, of a person. That's approximately where it is. But as I change my configuration, um, right, I can do that. And then let's stick the legs out, too. Um, which one do I want? Notice how I can I can push the center of mass outside of the body. You know. So if you're doing a that's the beginning of a uh, a dive on the diving board, I suppose. Maybe your body would be um, like so. Forget how to pan. Um, but anyways, that's the center of mass. Uh, and a human is, is symmetric in general. And let's see, we've got um, all, all of the products have some value here. And I think I've got him at least, uh, well, the axes associated with the green and the blue plane. Um, oh, yeah, I did torsion a little bit. If I get him back... We should see, I don't know if I've got him quite out of uh, whack here, but you could get this to where um, one of the products of inertia goes to, goes to zero or more um, associated with the planes of symmetry of the person. And the, and the last thing I want to show here is um, there's a thing called a inertia ellipsoid, and it is a visualization of the inertia of an object, okay? So you can, you can think of the moments of inertia, these three values, as the um, distance from the center to the edge of an of a ellipsoid, right? And this ellipsoid is aligned with the principal axes, and the three radiuses of this ellipsoid are associated with the moments of inertia of the, of the body in question. So here we can see very clearly now principal axes of that. I could express, if I rotate these two axes to that, that's going to express this only in, in three value, two values in that plane, um, the moment of inertia about this and about this. Okay, so this is a way to visualize the inertia. And it's long, just like the person has a lot of inertia about that axis, right? and has less inertia about um, this axis, okay? So you can, ca you can create an inertia ellipsoid for any object, and it aligns with the principal axes, and, uh, you know, we can 
you can imagine, in this case, we get all these parameters we can change that change the configuration of these, this collection of rigid bodies. And we get the total center mass and the total inertial ellipsoid reflected in the numbers there, and then also these two visualizations. Okay, so I just wanted to show that as a, to help connect, you know. So the I, we calculate in this program, I call IG somewhere in there and find these principal directions in the, in the moments of inertia, and then you can make this representation. So any object, any, no matter where, how weird it is, and you know, we can make it um, no longer symmetric if I abduct one of the legs, right? And then the principal axes are now lined like on an axis that's sort of skewed. Now the axis is like, you know, got a component in all three of those directions. Okay? And I think that's my time. All right? Thank you much. Come see me in office hours, and we'll talk dynamics. And then um, Wednesday, I think we'll be starting on, we'll be starting on forces. Okay, forces and torques.